So this lack of effectiveness is confirmed really by naturalistic studies such as the STAR-D trial, which was um, a, a trial that enrolled a whole load of people with depression. It didn't have a placebo group, but it, um, it, it involved giving people a series of different antidepressants. And when the uh, data was analysed properly by, by someone who was a bit more sceptical than the rest of the team, it was clear that the number of people who actually got better and stayed better on antidepressants was absolutely minuscule. That's that tiny little column in the middle there. <laughs> um, and uh, lots of people, uh, some people got better, but lots of people then relapsed again or they just dropped out because they were fed up and it wasn't working. This is a study that shows that antidepressants um, uh, people who take antidepressants are less likely to get back to work, people who are having a, a period of sick leave. Um, so the, the percentage of people who return to work is higher among people, with, these are all people with depression, who don't take antidepressants. Of course, this may well be to do with the fact that their depression isn't quite as severe, but I wanted to show you this because this study was reported as showing that antidepressants help people get back to work. I can't remember how they did it now, but they used some sort of statistical means to, uh, to show exactly the opposite of what they'd actually found. Um, and uh, th this was just a study of disability benefits that I did recently, um, which, which shows that as antidepressant prescription levels have gone up, the number of people on long-term disability with, for depression and stress and other sorts of disorders has gone up too. So, they're not, they're not helping people get back to work or get back to um, uh, productive lives. Antidepressants probably don't have quite the same scale of adverse effects as antipsychotic drugs, but they do rarely have some quite serious complications. And one of these, which is um, starting to come out, but, but there's not been very much interest in it in mainstream li literature, is this idea that they can cause persistent sexual dysfunction. So we know that they cause sexual impairment while you're taking them in a large number of people, probably at least sort of 50, 60%. Um, but what is coming out is that in some people who stop taking them, that sexual impairment continues, often for a good few years. And this, this evidence is coming from, not from mental health or psychiatry, but from sexual health clinics where they're increasingly seeing people who've been on these drugs and are coming along with complaints that their sexual function is still um, not what it was before they took the drugs. They cause withdrawal effects, and again, in a small number of people, those withdrawal effects seem to be really protracted and really difficult and can go on for months and possibly for years. Um, and there's been lots and lots of debate about whether or not they increase suicidal behaviour and thoughts. And there is, in, it, I, I think the evidence is, is now fairly conclusive that in young people particularly, they do seem to have this effect in a small number of people. There's also some evidence they cause fetal malformations. And I, and I think the psychological effects of antidepressants are really important to acknowledge as well. Um, when someone's given a pill, when, when someone's unhappy, probably got lots of problems in their lives, and they're given a pill as the answer to that, there's a message that goes along with that pill that says the problem is in your brain. You can't address it. You need the pill to address it. Even if the doctor is also saying, oh, you must also go to therapy, you must also do this, almost also do that, the, the pills carry this, this strong symbolic message. Um, and, and the other issue is that if the pills are altering your mental state, dampening down your emotions, making you a bit lethargic, you may not be able to sort out the problems that, that led you to seek help in the first place. So if we're going to use antidepressants in a drug-centered way, this is the sort of information that I think we should give to people. Um, the, the standard view, the standard information that's given at the moment is, you know, take an antidepressant, it'll help rectify your serotonin imbalance, or at the very least people are told, it, you know, it'll it'll improve your depression with the Im implication that it's going to work on the source of the depression. If we were taking a drug-centered view, we'd, we'd be saying to people, we've got these, these drugs um, that affect the way that people think and feel in some way, although we don't know much about this because we haven't bothered to research it. 
Um, but what we do know is that they dampen down emotions a little bit. They're going to impair your sex drive and your sex life, probably sort of make you feel a bit demo demotivated and lethargic. And then we could ask people if they wanted to take them or not. And you know what? Some people would say yes. So just quickly before I finish, I just want to think about why it is that this disease-centered model of drug action has become so, so dominant and has, has eclipsed um, our understanding of, of the alterations that drugs produce. And I think it's... I think it's because it serves the interests of three powerful groups and, and these interests come together. And those interests are the interests of, of psychiatrists and the medical profession, the interests of the pharmaceutical industry and the interests of the state. So professional interests, the psychiatric profession has been trying since it first came into existence in the 19th century to prove that they're real doctors and they're dealing with a real medical problem. And of course, the idea that their drug treatments are treating an underlying disease helps support that view. It was really particularly important to put this view across in the 1960s, when, when the disease-centered model of drug action really sort of coalesced. And that was because there was an increasing problem of recreational drug use. And the drug culture of the 1960s started with the diversion of prescribed drugs. So that's something I was not aware of until I started reading about it. This is a quote from a US senator about how the pharmaceutical industry's multi-million dollar advertising budgets, frequently the most costly ingredient in the price of a pill, have, pill by pill, led, coaxed and seduced post-World War II generations into the freaked out drug culture plaguing the nation. In 1970, 5% of Americans were prescribed amphetamines. So that's what he's talking about. Um, and, and so it was necessary for, for doctors to distance themselves from that and say, you know, we're, we're not just giving people drugs to make them feel high or to put them in an altered state, we're giving them proper disease treatments. The pharmaceutical industry were quite comfortable with the drug-centered model up until the 1980s because they could there are a lot of people who want to take something that makes them feel different. So they had a big market um, and they were doing very well um, selling their drugs like Valium and things like that. Um, in the 1980s, it became apparent that millions of people, especially women, were being put on benzodiazepines like Valium, basically to keep them quiet and stop them complaining. Um, and, uh, and it was obvious that they were not as safe as they were, had been portrayed to be, it, they were definitely addictive. They'd been marketed as something that, was le that wasn't addictive. And um, so there was a big scandal about that. And the pharmaceutical industry then needed to make sure that people didn't think they were doing that same sort of thing again. So when, the, when their next blockbuster drugs came out, those were the SSRIs in the 1990s, they made sure that those drugs were marketed alongside the idea that these drugs are being given to treat a disease. And uh, I think the usefulness of this idea is summed up in this little quote from Eli Lilly's website as well. Antipsychotic medicines are believed to work by balancing the chemicals found naturally in the brain. So olanzapine is this drug that makes you put on loads and loads of weight. You can see how unnatural this drug is just by looking at someone who's taking it. Um, but this makes it sound as if it's practically homeopathic. And this, this view you know, made antipsychotics seem so benign that they were even advertised for children. Here's an advert featuring a girl of, I don't know, 12, 13 years old. There was this idea that you have to prescribe them as quickly as possible um, in order to uh, prevent people getting unwell. And this culminated in the scandal of pediatric bipolar disorder where antipsychotics and other drugs were prescribed to children with behavior problems who were basically... Um, who, who were given this label of bipolar disorder, ag again helping to expand the market for these very toxic drugs. And this is Rebecca Riley, who, who sadly died at the age of four on a cocktail of four or five different sedative agents, including um, an antipsychotic, and had been given that diagnosis. But I, I, don't think, um, I don't think pharma, and certainly the psychiatric profession, would have been able to be 
as influential and to have put this message forward if it wasn't also convenient for governments, a convenient message for governments. And it's convenient because seeing psychiatric treatments as a disease treatment allows us to paint um, uh, things like the restriction and forced hospitalization of people with mental health problems as a benign activity, as treating a disease, as a, as a nice therapeutic endeavor. Um, and of course, we don't just um, forcibly put people in hospital anymore in the UK, and I know in a lot of states in the US as well, uh, people can be forced to take drug treatment who are in the community. So those people are often functioning reasonably normally um, they don't need to be in hospital, they can certainly look after themselves outside hospital, but we are forcing them to take drug treatment that they don't want to take. And the point about the disease model of drug action is it allows us to see this as a, as a benign, as a therapeutic endeavour. And as Thomas Saz put it, we don't need to feel guilty about it. It takes the guilt away. So... Just to sum up very quickly, and then hopefully we've got some time for questions. The disease-centered model, this is the idea that drugs are working by targeting an underlying chemical imbalance, assumes that giving drug treatment is a good thing. doesn't mean you should always do it, but it, it assumes you should, you should do it unless there's a good reason not to, because, of course, you're curing an underlying disease. You're helping to normalize the body in some way, so why wouldn't it be a good thing? Um, and that's partly why there's been this huge expansion in the use of drugs for mental health problems um, uh, that, that we've seen recently. The drug-centered model highlights that drugs are chemical substances that alter and modify the way that the brain and body normally work. So they are, there are inevitably dangers associated with taking them. So this model should, I think, if it's applied, lead people to be much more cautious about the use of these drugs. As I said at the beginning, I think there are some situations where they can be useful, but many, many situations where they do much more harm than good. Okay, so thanks very much.